Um, okay, so uh, welcome to tutorial number five or so on C++. Um, the first part of this, uh, I'm just going to go over some of the basic features of C++. And then in the second part, we'll see how far we get. Uh, there's also like a, a bit of coding that we can do together. So we'll see how, how that goes. So uh, before we start, uh, can I get like a quick poll of like how many people um, already know C++? Okay, about half. And then um, <laughs> yeah, I noticed you didn't raise your hand, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure you do. So. <laughs> um, and then how many people know Java? Okay, and then Python. Pretty much everyone. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's interesting. I, I kind of assumed that like the, the intro classes were all taught in Java. So, um, so one one thing is that um, you'll notice that C plus plus is very similar to Java, or maybe rather um, Java is very similar to C plus um, plus, and Python is also is also similar to C plus plus. They're all part of the same uh, family of languages. Um, so so C um, C was like the original uh, language in this family, and it's developed in the 70s, uh, Bell Labs, and then C++ is like a, a minor improvement on it. And in some ways, it adds certain uh, uh, lots of different features, basically. But every C program is actually a valid C++ program. So that's pretty cool. Um, OK, so why, why would you want to use C++? So, um, so in ROS, at least, um, there's two main languages that Languages that are officially supported: C++ and Python. So uh, C++'s primary philosophy is uh, speed and efficiency. So not making you pay the cost of anything that you don't actually need. Um, so it will actually compile your code down directly into a machine language. So you don't need to. Um, whereas uh, Python or even Java, they come with uh, additional runtimes that run between your code and the machine that you're operating on. So um, those runtimes provide you with things like array out of bounds checks and type checks and um, other other like runtime run things, garbage collection. Um, but they can potentially slow down your program. So C++ offers none of those features at runtime, um, but it will run very fast. And so it's, it's good for high performance stuff. Um, and uh, also, like of all the languages that have sort of followed uh, C, C++, or have tried to improve on it, um, and be fast uh, without like without having a runtime, uh, none of them are particularly widely used. So the the one the I think the two big ones are going to be in the C, C++ family languages that are Python and Java, and um, those are widely used, but they're not uh, they're not fast necessarily. So. Um, so why not use C++? Well, um, it's uh, it's a very complicated language, actually. Like the specification for it is um, is probably like textbook length uh, that just describes what the, how the language should work and what it should do. Um, and then also um, for a large enough project, uh, it's going to take a while to compile your code. So in Python, you never compile your code, so the, the compilation time is zero. And you, you just pay that cost at runtime. In Java, you might actually have a slow build with a large enough Java program. But in C++ in particular, um, there's some things about the way it's constructed that uh, make compilation slow. Um, so you can have builds for, for, a lar for like a very large C++ project. It's not unheard of to have like several minutes uh, of just compiling. OK, so I'm going to go uh, straight into just like different features. And we're going to start building on like how to write a C++ program. So, um, so on the right is a Java program that's just like a simple Hello World program. And then on the left is C++. So um, I'll just go ahead and point out um, some of the features of this. Oh, I always want to use a laser pointer. OK, so, um, okay, so the first thing is this uh, pound include IO stream. So, um, that's not a hashtag. Okay, it's it's pound. <laughs> so don't don't ever call this hashtag include. That would, that would just be really sad. So, um, so uh, basically, this will import um, the symbols uh, C out and end L, which you'll need to have this line. So um, 
in Java, you don't need to import anything, but you're familiar with the idea of like having to import like java.util.hashmap or whatever, right? So, um, but in Java, you just have direct access to the system. So, um, int main, very similar to void main, and then uh, int argc and char star star argv. This is just getting the command line arguments that you passed into your program. So it's identical to the string array of args. So if you're not familiar with um, C strings, uh, C, C++ don't have uh, primitive string types. Uh, strings are instead just considered to be arrays of characters. And then because arrays are roughly equivalent to pointers, uh, which we'll talk about more later, um, a star star is like an array of strings, basically. So um, this is the way in which you sort of send stuff to standard output. Um, you use like this, this double arrow thing to sort of say that you're like sending this stuff and it sort of points towards standard output. And then endl is just like a new line character. And then finally return zero is just a convention in uh, most Unix programs that if there wasn't a problem with the program, then you return zero. Otherwise, you return some kind of error code. Now, um, we're going to be building, or I'm going to refer to a, a robot class as an example uh, throughout most of this talk. And so uh, this is what, this is like the general uh, outline of what the class would look like in Java. It's just going to be a sim simple class that has a name and like a constructor that assigns a name, and then in, it will say its name. So it has a public method that does that. So um, in Java, the way you create a new class is just to say new robot, and then you can pass in constructor parameters. So now this is how you do the same thing in C++. So um, in C++, you actually have two files to do this. Um, you don't have to, but uh, it's generally the convention that you have a .h file, which is a header file, and then a .cpp file or .cc file, which is a, a C++ file. So um, why are there um, two files? Well, the header file is basically for uh, just describing the structure of the code. And then the uh, CPP files actually contain the implementation itself. Um, so the main reason for this is, is sort of like height. So you can hide the implementation. So you can, um, other people can uh, write code that uses your header file, and they can look at your header file. But then what you actually give them for its implementation is a compiled binary. And so they can't actually read the code. They just get a compiled thing. So if you give them the compiled thing and the header file together, then they can see how your class should be used, but they can't read the code itself. Um, if you compare that to like uh, Java, where your class definitions are inline, like if someone wanted to look at the structure of your code, they also have to look at all the code itself. So um, this, is, this is part of its design of not making you paying for the stuff that you don't need to use. It's, it's, it's a complex story about compiling stuff. And uh, again, like C++ is a very old language. And so like other people have had hindsight when they develop new languages. So um, you know, this, it's not saying that this is the best system, but it's a system that C++ has. Um, now, uh, there's also this funny um, pound if and def, pound define uh, directives. So actually, everything with a pound sign in front is called a preprocessor directive. And it does kind of what, what it sounds like. It, it does a once over on your code before it gets to the compiler. And it'll do things like remove comments and also uh, process these things. So basically what this does is that it, um, it just ensures that your header file is only included once. So, so first of all, to use, to use a class, you might include your header file and then um, what the CPU processor does, you can think of it as basically copying and pasting the contents of that file and just putting it right there where it says pound include robot.h. And so if lots of different uh, uh, lots of different files are including robot.h, then you don't want it to be included multiple times. So that's what the that's what this uh, pound define guard is. So it's very common to see this. Um, Again, there's no primitive string type, so there's a library, standard library called string that, that does this for you. Um, instead of like saying things are private or public uh, individually, you'll add, you have blocks for like everything between here and here is private, everything from here to here is public. Um, you have your con constructor definitions, and then you have um, 
like here the name is, is private and then same name and then there's this const here so const just means that the function this method won't uh, won't modify this object so it's, it's basically a read-only function and then here's the actual implementation it's just a constructor uh, so in the implementation you need to include your header file and then um, you use this colon colon to, as, as kind of like a way of uh, specifying uh, a namespace so robot is the, refers to the class and then the second robot refers to the name of the constructor um, then there's this colon it's like there's this thing between the uh, the argument list and the the open bracket that you might not see in other languages. So this is just a way of initializing variables. Um, so here we're we're assigning a name underscore to the empty string in the default constructor. But if you give it a name, then then we're just assigning name to name, and uh, and the constructors are empty in both cases because they don't do anything else. Um, also, one thing to note is that uh, convention in C++, or at least the convention that, that I'm referring to, uh, is to uh, append an underscore to the end of all uh, member variables. Um, I'll, I have a link to basically the ROS C++ style guide and then also the Google C++ style guide. Um, they're, they're very close, um, and, and the ROS one is actually based on the Google one. So um, this is just adhering to, to that style. Um, OK, so that's how you make a class. Uh, are there any questions so far about that? No? OK. Yeah? If you already define whether it's private or public in your header file, do you have to do it again? Uh, no. So the question was, do you need to say public or, and private in the implementation file? And the answer is no. So. Here, uh, say name is a public method, but there's nothing here. You don't have to do that. OK, so here is how you, you uh, use a class. So um, there's actually three different ways in which you can do it. Um, the first one, robot r. Um, so this style basically creates a local variable called r, and it allocates it on the stack. Um, robot r2, so here there's no parentheses. So um, if you did this in Java, um, then this would basically just be like an undefined variable, right? Like it's it would be like null or something like that, right? But um, in C++, actually, if you don't put any parentheses, that calls the default constructor, the one with no arguments. So this is actually a perfectly valid uh, initialization right here, and so you can immediately call say name, and it'll just have like it'll just do whatever the default constructor did. Basically. And then the third one, uh, which looks kind of the most like Java, is to say uh, robot star r3 equals new robot. So the new keyword um, in C++ means that this object should be allocated on the heap, and then it will return a pointer to where it was allocated. Um, so this also a quick poll, like how many people are familiar with, like is this like a review, or, or like are people familiar with like uh, memory segments and stuff like that, or like layout of memory, kind of? No? OK, we'll, we'll, we'll actually talk about this a little bit more. Um, but, but yeah, unfortunately, it'll just be confusing. But OK, so let's move on. So uh, for those of you who have done like CS interviews and practices, uh, or like you, you sort of know that like kind of the two most important data structures for you to actually know are uh, lists and hash, hash tables. So. I'm going to go over uh, just a quick examples of how to use them both. Um, so if you're interested in, in finding out what data structures are available and what all the methods are on them, just search for them online. Um, the, the library that provides most of the data structures and algorithms in C++ is called the Standard Template Library, um, also known as the STL. So just search for Standard Template Library or just search for like C++ set or something, you know, if you want to find out about sets. So um, lists in um, C++ are called vectors. So here, um, uh, and and they're all part of the standard namespace. So you need to say std dot dot or colon colon vector robots. So here we created two robots, and then use pushback to append uh, an item to a vector. 
then you can iterate over over them using a uh, for for range range based for loop. So uh, C plus plus, you have the like identical if statements, identical while statements, identical do while, almost identical switch statements, everything like that, right? And and that goes for for uh, for loops as well. So you can say for in i equals zero, i is less than robots dot size plus plus i. Um, but for um, objects that like define an iterator, you can use a, a range based for loop in C plus um, plus. We're also assigning um, when when you say robot instead of just saying for robot robot, we're actually using this ampersand right here. Uh, the ampersand means uh, get a reference to it without copying it. So um, this is just a minor efficiency thing. And then const means we're not going to modify the robot while uh, while we're while we're in this loop. Um, so it's a good idea to try and use const as much as possible because the compiler will actually check whether or not you are doing things. So it's basically an assertion that you are not going to change this thing. So it's, it's, it's good to have. And finally, you can also access them using like an array-like syntax using square brackets. OK, now um, hash tables. So if you actually look for uh, C++ maps, you'll actually get something that's the equivalent of a tree map in Java. So it's going to be an ordered map. So if you want a hash table, uh, what you want is an unordered map. So basically, uh, you'll pound include an unordered map. And then you can kind of use it. It has it has methods for insertion as well, but you can also do this kind of uh, syntax where if you access something that um, doesn't exist in the hash table yet, then it'll actually insert one using the default constructor, and then you can assign, and then it'll actually return a reference to it so that you can assign it to something else. So in this case, uh, Rosie doesn't exist in the hash table yet. So it will create a new uh, Rosie, or, or create a new robot with the default constructor, and then and then it becomes assignable to whatever you want to assign it to. And similarly here, and then um, you can also access them by um, by doing this. So what would happen if you, uh, let's say, if I said like uh, I don't know, Tozy or something, right? Dot say name. Then basically you would get a default constructed robot, and then it would Say say name, so um, that's hash tables. And obviously, there's lots more methods. Like you can iterate over it, you can uh, delete stuff, and you can check whether something exists, and so on. So just just search that online. Okay. So one thing that um, is of particular concern to uh, in C plus plus is that um, pretty much everything you write, if it's aligned on like the or Everything you write is going to be in what's called the global namespace. So um, basically, the problem is that you have like this large C++ program, and then you define classes and functions and stuff. And what happens if you define a class or a function with the same name that someone else defined, and then you, you include that file? Um, so the way in which you sort of protect against this possibility is that you sort of prefix your name with some other name. So in this case, like we might be concerned that someone um, has already defined uh, a class called robot, and so what we need to do to protect against that possibility is to put it inside of a namespace. Um, so in this case, our our thing is not going to be called robot anymore. It's going to be called my project colon colon robot, um, and then and then the definition of robot is just the same as before. So now um, let's take a look at this. So so now uh, when I when I use this thing, I need to prefix this by saying my project colon colon robot r instead of just saying robot r. Um, however, if you write code that is inside of a namespace, so here in main.cpp I, I say namespace my project, then actually all the code inside of this namespace does not need to have the my project uh, prefix to it. So here, if you're inside my project, then you can just say uh, robot r without saying my project. So um, namespaces are just something that you'll see, and then you'll you'll sort of wonder like when does something need a colon colon in front of it or not? 
uh, this is why. Um, now, it can be kind of annoying to have to type in colon colons and stuff like that. You sort of know that what you're using is unique uh, in your file, so you, like, what, why worry about it? So what you can do is that there's this thing called the using directive. So with the using directive, you can either import um, a specific name, like standard string, so, or, or you can import an entire namespace. Um, so if you, if you do this first example where you import a specific name, and here um, standard string just becomes string, but you still have to say standard C out or standard endl. So, um, so this only imports the name string for your, for your use. Sorry, I'm like, either way or something. Uh, anyways, or maybe I'll shift this over. Is that better? Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you if you import an entire namespace, then everything that was in the namespace uh, standard std uh, no longer needs the prefix. So um, this is a this is a generally not a good idea. Uh, because it's going to basically spill out uh, all the names in the namespace, or, or it's definitely not a good idea in header files. So, and, and we'll talk about that uh, next. So basically, um, the deal with pound include is that um, if A pound includes B, and then B pound includes C, then A also has everything that C defined in it. So if you decide in your c.h to say using namespace standard or, or something like that, right? Then all of the names in standard are going to be in c. And therefore, they're going to be, they're all going to be in b and they're all going to be in a. So like one like analogy to this is like, imagine um, you have like three boxes and then inside each box is, are like several bags of Legos. Okay, so when you include a file, that's kind of like pouring one box into another. And then when you say using namespace, so each bag of Legos is kind of like a namespace. So if you if you pour you know each box into the other, at the end you're just going to end up with like this neat pile of like this neat collection of like bags of Legos, right? Which is not that bad. It's it's fairly manageable. But if like on on like uh, one of the one of the boxes you decide to pop open one of the bags, right? And then you pour it in. Right, so all the Legos spilled out here, and then you pour it into the next box, and all those Legos are still spilled out here, and then like, and finally, when you when you pour it into the last one, then you know you just have like this huge mess because you opened one of the bags earlier. So you wanna you wanna try and keep things uh, neat and compartmentalized as much as possible. And so that's why um, uh, I think the the Google style guide definitely this is a no no. And then this is allowed, but not in header files, because header files are actually included by other people. Whereas uh, if you use this in, a, in an implementation file, well, no one's going to include your implementation file. So implementation files are kind of like the leaf of this tree. Uh, header files are like kind of like oh, not the leaf. So OK. OK, so now. Um, OK, so who's familiar with, with pointers? Who like understands pointers? Yeah? OK. Pointers, uh, references are, yeah, they're, if you, OK. So OK, so basically, everyone, everyone knows that, like, um, so, so basically, again, here's what's happening when you say new robot Mosey, for example. Oh, wait, this is wrong. OK, this should say Mosey. Um, or this should say Rosie, actually. So what happens is that, um, you're going to, so this is like the, the general layout of memory. Um, hopefully you've seen a drawing like this before. So R itself is going to contain the address of where uh, the robot was allocated, but the robot was allocated on the heap. Um, and then this is just a local variable, so it goes on the stack, and then R itself is also a local variable. So. Um, Okay, so that's that's pointers, and then um, you might have uh, so so you might have heard that like in in Java um, that the primitive types are passed by value, and and object types are passed by reference, um, and I, I think that's not 
uh, very precise, or it's not, not quite accurate. So um, I think in Java, everything is, is really passed by value, but, um, but there's the kind of like the, there's kind of like syntactic sugar that makes objects seem like they're being passed by reference when, when in fact it's a pointer being passed by value. So anyways, um, C++ has, has real uh, references, but we tend to avoid uh, using them. Um, so, so anyways, I'll talk first of all just about the function call convention. So here um, we have this function called do something, and then there's kind of like three ways in which you can pass in a robot. So one is by reference, another is by value. So to pass something in by reference, you, you add an ampersand to the end of the type. Uh, value, you don't do anything special. And then if you want to pass a pointer to a robot, then you use a star. So what happens, so assume that name is, is now a public uh, member. So before it was private, but now let's just assume that it. So if you, if you say uh, do something with three identical robots, and then um, and you pass them in, what's going to happen is that uh, if you pass it in by reference, then internally uh, C++ will convert that into a pointer. And then, uh, or the, the compiler will turn that into a pointer, and then it converts every reference into a basically like dereferencing with pointer. Um, so if you rename it to Rosie here, then robot one's name will be renamed outside. If you pass it in by value, then you're actually making a copy of it. So if you rename it inside, then it does not get changed on the outside. And then if you use a pointer, and then the way in which you access uh, pointer methods and members is with the, uh, the arrow. So the arrow is just syntactic sugar on top of dereferencing a pointer and accessing a member of it. Uh, then it will change it. Yeah? Are there any advantages of using pointers versus references? Besides maybe that you can actually do pointer arithmetic, which is sometimes not a problem anyway. Yeah, so um, is, there, is there an advantage to either? So I think. The, I, I'll, the, I'll, I'll just explain the convention, but uh, so the convention on the, in, on the next page is to pass in um, all your inputs as constant references, um, and then all your outputs as pointers. And um, so there's, and, and you also arrange your inputs first. If it's a primitive type, then it doesn't need to be a constant reference, because that's just kind of a waste. So. Um, but all, all your outputs are pointers. So um, I mean, the main differences between passing in something by reference uh, versus passing in a pointer is just like uh, at the function call, when you when you actually call the function, um, if you were to pass in a pointer, then you need to give it the address of that thing. Um, whereas if you pass it by reference, then you don't need to do anything. It just like um, so here you can see we call do something, and then um, the first parameter r is a robot reference. So we don't have to do anything special here. Um, whereas uh, R2 and Num2, you pass in the address of them to give them a pointer, to, to give it a pointer. Uh, so uh, this is kind of like a way of like documenting which ones are inputs and which ones are outputs. And this is kind of like a way also of giving you multiple uh, return values. So um, like Java and unlike Python and C++, you cannot return more than one value, so. Um, OK, so, so, so one thing is just like kind of like how it ends up looking to people. Another reason um, to pass in uh, inputs as references is uh, so that you don't like delete the pointer or something like that. Um, so, so the pointers themselves are passed by value, so well, Anyways, like, okay, so if someone gives you a pointer, then you can go in and, and basically mutate it, and like, you can't, uh, you can't sort of like enforce that it won't, uh, it won't change, for example. So, um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I guess, I guess I don't, I, I, I can't like clearly articulate what the, what all the, all the benefits are, but, uh, Let's see. Yeah. Any, anyways. Um, 
OK, so anyways, this is, this is like a, just a convention. Um, so if you want to assign, um, like, like, return and output, basically what you do is that you allocate it first before calling it, and then you pass in the address of it. And then inside of the function, uh, you can you just mutate it, basically. So you just modify it, and then you just return. You don't return anything. It's just a void function. Um, yeah, so I think that this is just like mostly like a self-documenting kind of thing. Um, and then uh, there might there might be other benefits with like, uh, like pointer pointer safety and stuff like that. It's also a good idea to make all your inputs const. So here I actually neglected to make the int const, but it, it could be const. So um, okay. So um, now that uh, you guys have uh, seen all this, so. Um, if you search for a C++ tutorial, the first one that comes up is this first link, C++ tutorial. Um, there's also like this really cool book on like it's like an ebook, and the guy's not done with it, but it's called Learn C the Hard Way. And uh, basically, you have a, a access to a Linux computer via SSH or a Mac, then you can do it, and it's basically like a long uh, book with like like 50 or so chapters, and each chapter is basically like talking about something about C, and then like it makes you like type all the code out and like write the make files and use like the use like these uh, extra tools on top of it like Valgrind and stuff. So it, it's a pretty interesting book. Um, you might you might be interested in checking it out. Um, the Raw C++ style guide, uh, of course, is a thing. Uh, it, it so so they actually say that they're based on the Google C++ style guide, except they changed some of the formatting and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's fairly short. C++ style guide is a, a lot longer, and um, it has recommendations about like what language features to use in what situations. So for example, like don't use uh, the using directive to import a name in header files. Um, whereas the this one I think is mostly concerned with formatting and naming and stuff like that, so. Um, OK. OK, so with this, um, I think we can actually, we actually have a fair amount of time to, to uh, write a little bit of C++ ourselves. So are there any uh, questions so far? OK, fantastic. So, um, so if you have, um, a Linux computer with ROS Hydro installed on it, then you are free to use your own computer. But otherwise, um, you can SSH into my computer as HCR Lab. Uh, the password is right here, uh, keeping in mind that this is being recorded. So, and uh, basically, if you don't already have a folder, called uh, with your UW net ID in it, then just make it. And if you don't already have a Catkin workspace, then create it. Oh, sorry, the last line, um, which says source cat can make, oh my gosh, this is awful. So um, it should source uh, cat can workspace. Um, keep in mind that this is the cat can workspace inside of your UW net ID folder and not the root. So everyone should be working inside their own folder. Uh, do not create a cat can workspace in the HCR lab home folder. Uh, create your own folder and then make your cat can workspace inside of it. So 
sorry, is it? Hopefully it's not too small now. Ah, uh, okay. The source? Oh, it, it sort of um, sets that folder, it sort of sets various environment variables to make your folder like an active development environment, like other other programs use environment variables to figure out. Yes, yes, you want, you want one based on your development ID. So. Uh, did you, can you, you ran Kaki Mate? Yeah, this is directory. Um, the metric I succeeded. There was one morning. Oh, that's fine. But it seems like. Oh, oh so, so when you're inside, you're already inside of Kaki Workspace, so you yeah. just need to say source devel slash slash slash. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, sorry, this is this is uh, also a typo, I guess. It, it should actually just be source uh, yeah, okay. devel. Okay, nice. Yeah. De it's devel slash set of that bash. Okay, so it seems like everyone's pretty close. You've gotten you successfully sourced your devel slash setup dot bash. Yeah. Um, so okay, so now go ahead and um, cd into uh, your Catkin workspace slash src. So the last one just tells you to cd into the source folder of your Catkin workspace. Is everyone in, inside their source folder? OK. Uh, it's important to be in there because this next command, catkin create package, uh, needs to be run inside that folder. So uh, you're going to create a package called CPP tutorial. And it depends on ROS CPP and standard messages. And uh, when you say ls, you should see like a cmake list.txt, a source folder, an include folder, and a package.xml. So yeah. Is everyone, everyone there? Yeah, you're good? You're good? OK, perfect. OK, so now um, what you can do is that I have left a, uh, I have a node running on my computer, uh, which is outputting a bunch of random numbers. Um, but they're actually not random, and so we're going to try and like get gain a little bit of insight into what these numbers are. So uh, if you type in uh, Ross topic info random numbers, uh, it'll give you some information about the what's coming in on the topic random numbers. So it should say um, so so uh, so what 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 type is it first of all? Yeah. Float. Okay. Uh, here. <laughs> so that's the only candy I have, actually. So I just wanted to give it away. <laughs> okay, so it's a it's a float sixty four, which is actually a sixty four bit float. So the equivalent of that in C plus plus or Java is double, actually. So don't be confused. Now, um, if you say ROS message show standard messages float sixty four, you'll see the format of the of the message. It's just a single field called data, which is of type float sixty four. And then finally, if you say ROS topic echo random numbers, you can uh, get a look at some of the numbers that are coming out. OK, cool. So now. Um, if you go and you search online for ROS, C++, simple like publisher or something like that, you don't actually need to do that. But uh, if you do, um, you'll find like the basic like skeleton for how to write a publisher and subscriber in C++. So I've already copied that code into a file for you. So you can, um, you can copy it to your source folder. So assuming you're still inside of your CPP tutorial folder, 
um, you can run this copy command to copy subscriber.cpp into your source folder. Um, now, uh, hopefully, uh, um, so if you're not, if you don't know how to use um, Vim or Emacs, then, then Nano is like a pretty uh, standard, or it's a pretty simple text editor. So um, otherwise, um, you can you can you can just edit it basically using Vim or Emacs. Is everyone everyone got okay with that? All copied. Copy it. Stephanie. Yeah. You have it. Okay. Um, awesome. Okay. So first of all, there's going to be a couple of um, tasks that uh, you need to do uh, to make this work. So first. Uh, to avoid the debacle we had last time, um, everyone will assign their node a unique name, which is your UW net ID. Because um, as you know, if you have two nodes with the same name, then the older one will be killed, and then the newer one will be run up. So right now, um, what is what is the node's name right now? Listener, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. So that's just that's part of the ROS init function. Um, so just change it to be your, your net ID so that you don't kill anyone else's uh, node when you bring yours up. Um, next, uh, you'll see that the subscriber is subscribed to the chatter topic. Sorry, how do you change my Vim? Uh, it, I mean, if you're not familiar with Vim, then, then you should use Nano. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so to exit, you say a uh, colon Q. Um, and, and if you're ahead, then uh, notice also at the top, it, it, there's a pound include standard messages string. Um, so instead of string, you'll want to change that to float64, just so that you have the float64 type. Um, now, if you look at the ROS CPP uh, documentation, which I have links to at the end of the slides, um, and you look at the publishers and subscriber stuff, it has, has much more detailed documentation compared to the tutorial. So in the tutorial, they show you just like this one way of doing it, but there's actually like like ten ways of like creating subscribers, and like maybe not ten, but like three to five or something like that, right? So. Um, so, anyways, we're gonna we're gonna change the signature of the chatter callback. Uh, you are also free to rename chatter callback if you want, because we're not listening to chatter anymore. But you you don't have to. Um, I'm just I'm just gonna change the signature to be a constant reference, uh, just so that we have these uh, nice. Um, we we obey the style guide uh, and have inputs be constant references. Um, the, the the thing that's there right now is that they have like these custom types, which are like <laughs> it's like a standard messages string const pointer. <laughs> it's like a constant pointer to, or it's like it's like a constant reference to a constant pointer to a string or something like that. So like you don't you don't need to do any of that. Just change it to be uh, just change it to be a const ref basically. Um, and then um, instead of so. Uh, who here is, is familiar with format strings and printf? Yeah? OK, yeah. So if you know format strings, then um, it says I heard and then percent %s. So that just means inject a string at that point. So change that to be a percent %f to make it inject a floating point number instead. And then because we're no longer taking in a pointer, um, and so we're taking in a reference, you can just say message.data instead of saying message arrow data. OK, so how, how is everyone doing? A scale of 1 to 3, so, so with 3 being done. <laughs> actually modify something that takes in strings to kind of subscribe to it. So uh, yes, yes, exactly. 
pound and clue thing? Is that it? Yes, so, so the pound and clue should be um, what it says uh, here, standard messages float 64.h oh. instead of string.h. Okay. So do you, do you have a question or, or anything? Or? Uh, I just I, I didn't know that you had it up there, so I was just listening to it. Oh, okay. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm actually going to move on now then. Um, I didn't think we would actually move this fast, but uh, that's that's a good thing. So, actually, we're almost out of time. So, um, now uh, for the fun part. So, if you write a Python program in ROS, then you don't need to compile it. Uh, uh, you still need to run cat can make if you're going to create messages or services or actions. Um, but if you just add code or or modify Python code, then you don't need to do anything, right? So in C++, every time you modify the code, you do have to compile it. So, uh, and before you can even do that, actually, you need to set up your CMake list. So this, uh, this basically is a specification of how your program should be built. And, um, and by default, uh, when you say cat can create package, it will generate a helpful CMake list with like a ton of comments in it telling you exactly what to do. Uh, but uh, it, does, it does not have um, the whole C++ thing set up yet. So you need to scroll down to near the bottom where it says build in like this rectangular thing. And then you'll see there's this thing, there's these two, these three commands like include directories, add executable, and target link libraries. Um, so the, the first one and the third one are, are three lines long. So you need to you need to uncomment the whole thing between the parentheses, basically. Um, and so basically, uh, I mean, we don't have any include files, so but what include directories does is that it um, it tells uh, tell it, it basically specifies where your include files are, where your header files are. Um, add executable means um, here is an executable that we would like to create, and so the first part is the name, and then after that it's a list of files I think that uh, define it, or maybe it's it's the main file or something like that. Um, and then target link libraries is just bringing in uh, libraries that you specified, like raw CPP, standard messages, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, you, and and so if you were to use any libraries outside of ROS, you would also uh, link them here. And also uh, by default, the name of the executable, like in add executable, the name of the file is going to be called CPP tutorial node, which is actually a great name, but uh, Ours is called su subscribers, so we're just going <laughs> to just change that to be subscriber.cpp. Um, OK, how's, how's everyone doing? Everyone got that? Almost, yeah? All right, so uh, if, if so, then we can actually do the fun part, which is to build it. Um, so, hopefully, no one, everyone has done this exactly right, and there's no problems whatsoever. But we'll see. So, um, so just go up uh, two levels um, to your Catkin workspace. So again, this is your Catkin workspace, uh, not the H, not the one in the HCR lab one. Uh, so it should be you, your NetID Catkin workspace. Uh, unfortunately, you do have to be in the root of the Catkin workspace to build it, which is kind of annoying because that means you. Typically, you have two terminal windows open, one which is just for building, and then the other one which is for actually editing your code. Um, you can also use the ROS ed command to, to edit files from within this folder, but whatever. Um, and, and then just run cat can make, basically. So if uh, 
So if all goes according to plan, then it should give you some build output and then say like it was successfully built. Okay, yours looks like it was successful. Um, so this red is just, just red. All the red stuff is for the, I believe it's the linker output or something like that, or something, yeah. Yeah, I'm always uh, just like, the fact that comes out of Red is like an error color, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a scenic thing. Uh, okay, are you guys good? Did you get it to build or no? It's not successful. Not successful. Um, Okay, it's probably like a like a like a syntax error or something. Uh, um, it looks like it was successful, but you you might not have set up your CMake list to add. Did you uncomment add executable and stuff like that? Like those three things in your CMake list. Okay, yeah, it should it should per, it should have more output than that. Um, uh, basically, you need to uh, go back to your um, CPP tutorial and then edit cmakelist.txt. So in your cmakelist, um, near the bottom, I should say. Uh, no, uh, no, it's going to be um, source slash. So you should use um, tab completion as much as possible to try and figure out what's there. So now say CMake list. Yeah. And then um, near the bottom, uh, okay. Well, I, I can actually help you later since we're almost done. Um, so if, if you were able to successfully build it, then you can run your code by saying, ROS run CPP tutorial, CPP tutorial node. So again, ROS run, the first argument is the name of the package, and the second one is the executable name. And when you said add executable, you defined uh, the name of the executable to be CPP tutorial node. So you should be able to uh, run your code, and then if it, if it works, then it should be basically displaying the numbers So, so this is calling the default constructor. Yes. Yeah. And this is included because it's part of ROS.h. Yeah. And ROS.h is like it's just ROS. It's already. Uh, ROS.h includes a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so, so, um, yeah. Uh, like, it includes like a bunch of stuff. And stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. You can actually include like node handle and subscriber separately. Uh, I think it's better practice to do so, but they they do this for convenience. So, um, okay. So, anyways, if you were able to do all of that, then uh, what you could do is that you could basically use a global variable, and then in your callback, you can try and keep track of the average number that uh, is coming out, and then uh, yeah. So, whoever I, I was going to say that whoever has the can tell me like the closest or. And tell me the average number that's closest to what the average should be, then like I would give you like a Hershey's bar or something. But <laughs> I think I gave it away. Uh, yeah. If, if you don't want it, then I could just I, I don't think uh, this is a real competition though. So you can you can win brownie points. Hershey, I Hershey brownie points. <laughs> 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 yes. For years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you know this hasn't been around for years? <laughs> well, um, so so uh, one way in which you can avoid using global variables um, in the future is to write a class um, in which the uh, what would be global variables become members of, of the class. And then inside the class, you can subscribe to uh, a topic that is passed in. And then, uh, and then you can call average like an average function on that class. So, 
Um, okay, awesome. So uh, that's all I have uh, for the reading. So um, on the HCR Lab GitHub wiki, um, so on the wiki that's on our GitHub, um, you can find this thing called PCL sample, which is basically a very minimal example of how to process a point cloud. Uh, or it's mostly a minimal example of how to write a C++ class um, and that just happens to process point clouds. And it computes the average of it. So this, is, this was so, supposed to be kind of like a simplified version of that, except we didn't get around to writing any classes. Um, the ROS tutorials, of course, um, provide like basic examples of how to use topics, uh, publisher subscribers, services, whatever. Um, and then the ROS C++ overview is really great reading because the, the tutorials only they really only give you like the tip of the iceberg, but the overview gives you like it gives you like more of the iceberg, but not the full thing, which is like really nice. So, um, and then if you want the full thing, then you can look at the code API, um, which is basically the generated documentation for all the classes that are part of ROS. And then you can go in and click in and like find all the methods and read the documentation and you can click through and view the source for it and uh, so, so yeah these are in order of, uh, of complexity so um, yeah um, that's all I have so uh, thank you